Hello, everybody, and welcome to our seventh AgriTech talk, an initiative of the Regional Office of Europe and Central Asia designed to inspire us all to think tech when designing and implementing our projects and programs in less than 30 minutes a month. My name is Daniela Di Gian Antonio, and I am the team leader for digital agriculture at the FAO Regional Office and today's host. Today's special guest is Leone Magliocchetti Lombi, Agricultural Officer with the Plant Production and Protection Division of FAO. Welcome, Leone. Hi, Daniela. Welcome, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here with you today. Likewise, we are very pleased to have you. And Leone, we invited you to tell us how we can harness technology to help small scale farmers make smart decisions. So as usual, I have a few questions for you to get started, and then we will turn out to the audience. So dear colleagues, you can start writing down your questions and comments in the chat or raise your hand if you want to ask Leone anything. My co-host is Vanita Morrison, a digital agriculture analyst, and uh, she will be helping me with questions in the chat later. So, Leone, question number one. Um, you are the lead technical officer of a project called Smart Farming for the Future Generations, which is implemented in one country in our region in Uzbekistan. So, can you tell us more about it? Yes, of course. Thank you, Daniela. And once again, good morning or good afternoon to everyone uh, listening to this um, to this tech talk. So the Smart Farming for Future Generations is a project funded by the Republic of Korea, and it supports the value chain of nutrition vegetables, and in particular, it focuses on uh, protected cultivation systems managed by smallholders in Uzbekistan and also in Vietnam. Um, but it also focuses on um, local storing and grading actors and also on local market actors. Uh, because as we said, the, pro the project is focusing on the whole uh, value chain. Now, if we focus on, uh, if we zoom into the uh, bit of the support to smallholders, we, uh, the project is um, supporting uh, the protection part through qualified proximity technical support. Uh, in Uzbekistan, we have about 60 smallholders beneficiaries of the project, uh, each one of them with a, a greenhouse, and they are visited regularly, physically in presence by a technical, qualified technical expert every week at least, and they get advices and training on, on farm training about how good how to put in place good agricultural practices for a sustainable intensification of the production and um, they also are supported through the introduction of modern techniques and technology let me just mention a few of these like for example modern covering materials like the insect proof net or the which allows a reduction in the use of pesticides for some uh, against some pests and diseases but also uh, efficient irrigation technology to reduce the use of water, a smarter way of using fertilizers to, to reduce the consumption, the use of fertilizers and thus reducing potential pollution and so forth. But I would like also to mention the introduction of pollinator insects and there are so, so many of this. We also introduced um, some digital systems to support decision making, the decision making at, uh, at farm level. And um, <clears throat> we uh, wanted to test if so usually these systems are very expensive um I, i'm talking about internet of things uh, systems uh systems for example to inform the, the smallholder producer about soil humidity or the temperature inside the greenhouses however these systems as i as i said are usually very expensive and their rate of adoption among smallholders is very limited. And what we wanted to test was if, if it was possible to uh, rather base uh, uh, our systems on uh, on open source technology, which have a big promise, which is to be very low cost. And but we wanted to check against its accuracy and the durability and longevity through the time, because of course, if we want uh, smallholders to uh, receive um reliable decision support the 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 system has to be proof uh, as a reliable one so um this is what we we did we we chose uh four basic sensors 
one about soil moisture, uh, another one to measure air temperature and relative humidity inside the greenhouses, and also another one about light intensity, because these four basic elements are then determinant to, to take some crucial decision during farming. Let's think about, for example, uh, when it is the correct time, the most efficient moment for pollination, which is a very uh, hand, um, a very labor intensive activity. Or for example, when to perfectly irrigate or when it is time to actually open or close the the, uh, the windows in, inside the greenhouses. These are uh, activities that are normally um, practice somehow, um, I mean, based on the sensation or on physical uh, presence of the farmer inside the greenhouse. Um, and this would require, therefore, more time and presence of the farmer inside the greenhouses. So thanks to these systems, we are trying to increase the efficiency and the optimization of the production of, vegetable, of vegetables in, uh, in Uzbekistan. Thanks a lot, Leonid. This is so fascinating. So you are telling us smart farming is a combination on non-digital and digital improvements and that you're bringing basically precision agriculture to smallholders. But wait, you, you also told us that this is usually very expensive and uh, you are using open source Internet of Things. So now in very simple words, please explain to all of us what is open source, what is Internet of Things and how we can harness these technologies for the benefit of smallholders. Yes, all right. I think that, as we say, one concrete example is worth a thousand words. Let me show you something. Uh, this is a sensor. I hope you can see it. It is a very simple sensor, but um, it gives three key indicators. It provides soil temperature, soil humidity, I mean the moisture level, and also soil electroconductivity, which is a very interesting indi indirect indicator for soil fertility, especially if the farmer is using soluble fertilizers um, uh, during his um, cropping activities. So this sensor is uh, already waterproof. It can work very well both in water in case we are using nutrient solution or in the soil it can be buried there would be no issues and um, the cost of this sensor is about 60 dollars available in the retail market and uh, but this is just a sensor right like it has cables you see who is receiving the signal how can we read it well the open source uh, has i mean based on the open source there are numerous of these um, options. This is a microcontroller. It has dual core computing capacity, and it has also internet connectivity, Wi-Fi, and also Bluetooth connectivity. And it can be connected to the sensor. It can read the signals, interpret it, and then send data over the internet. And you know that once we reach the internet, we can do a lot of things. Like we could interact with numberless APIs from available online APIs, but also there are APIs to, to make the, the information available, for example, through message services, like, for example, WhatsApp, Telegram, Instagram, X, you name it. Of course, and, and, and the cost of this controller is less than $5 on, on the online um, retail market. And uh, provided that you work a little bit providing um, waterproof, let's say, agricultural glade enclosure, like this one, for example, you would put together for about $100 uh, a complete system that sends, that is able to send notifications and alerts to the, to, to the farmer, or at least to inform about what are uh, the environmental conditions inside the greenhouses. So this is uh, an example of something that can be developed through, through open source. But what does it mean open source? Open source is a set, actually it's a very large set, libraries, thousands of libraries of projects of electronic components and software to have these electronic components work, uh, which are available online and anybody can for free access to this project, modify to their fit, to fit their purpose and uh, without sustaining any, uh, sustaining any expense. So let's say that this way we are trading uh, against proprietary solutions. We are trading the fact that we are not we are really reducing, probably zeroing the cost for research and development. Of course, what we are not getting is something like 
other services, for example, after sale support or uh, mm, I would say uh, proper um, environmental uh, grading support. But as we said, there is always a trade-off. What is missing is um, is uh, just the capacity, I would say, uh, to code, to modify the software uh, in a way that could fit the purpose. But we will talk about this uh, later in a minute. I just wanted to say that this is an example uh, that I just showed you how we can connect the greenhouse to the internet. Let me pass this metaphor. But this is exactly the explanation of what it means, Internet of Things, because Internet of Things is a modern concept that has developed during the last 10 years. And uh, it's basically a, a concept that describing the fact that nowadays, not only laptops and computers or mobile phones can connect to the internet, but any object, let's think about AC, air conditioning modules or washing machines. Uh, we have today a lot of uh, objects that we were thinking that traditional we could not connect to it. And now they are equipped with sensors and with uh, internet connectivity. And they are now constituting a, a network of, of things that can even possibly talk to each other. Open source, um, the open source has of course boosted a lot the development of uh, the Internet of Things network. And uh, a a as we just showed, um, we can easily connect greenhouse or open fields or any other type of uh, objects we wanted. And uh, what we wanted to test through the project was to see if we could somehow put together a system um, that could support agricultural production for smallholders uh, without breaking the budget. Wow, well, Leone. So you are making smart sensors for less than $100, where in the market we will need to pay one, two thousand. So, or actually, I should say, we are making this because I think we need to reel the audience how we met. I think it was uh, exactly one year ago or so. And I was just starting the implementation of DVI in Uzbekistan, the Digital Villages Initiative. And I was looking for a potential village site where to implement it. So we went together to visit the sites of your project in Fergana Valley of Uzbekistan, and we found two very good villages to work with. And we decided to join forces to work as one file and really to design a program, a DVI intervention aimed to test this, to make how can we make smart farming technologies affordable for smallholders and how we can make how we can make this work both from a technology point of view, as you said, by using IoT and open source, but also by leveraging the human capacities uh, of Fergana Valley and more precisely the youth. And finally, how can we design a technology solution that will fit this specific context, the needs, the capacities of smallholder farmers in Fergana? So we joined forces. We are currently uh, implementing a DVI camp and the results we are obtaining are pretty exciting. So can you tell us about it? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, as I as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the hardware is not enough. We need the software. And for as much as software is available online, we still need somebody. We still need the capacities to, to read it and to modify to fit the purpose. Now, um, we are not expecting that today farmers start coding, of course. But we think that, uh, and actually this is a fact, uh, that open source can uh, trigger new business models, which are basically, um, which are locally based, not globally based, and are locally based where we uh, prime uh, capacities at local level to uh, interact and support and provide technical support to smallholders. And what is needed is a, is a basic training. And the DVI camp are doing exactly this because 25 youth are currently being um, primed to um, basics of machine um, computer sciences and, and coding to learn, learn coding using open source platforms. And uh, they have so far already reached uh, uh, a very decent level covering the basics. And they are already right now um, uh, testing their first prototypes in the field. They are in contact with farmers and they are 
troubleshooting and uh, and running the, their first trials. This is extremely interesting. They, I know that there will be a lot to learn for them yet, but at the same time, we the project, the two projects together, I are initiating something new. We are putting together youth, um, I would say, vocational training, and also farmers um, teaming up to solve um, one of the most ancient problem of uh, probably of humanity, which is how can we uh, produce nutritious vegetable in a more optimized way. Thanks a lot, Leone. So we are getting towards the end and I already saw a lot of questions in the chat. So let me remind colleagues to put their questions in the chat or to start raising their hands. Uh, so just a very final question for you. Uh, indeed, we have been piloting for a few months now together in Uzbekistan. You are also testing this in Vietnam. So what are the lessons learned so far? Okay. Of course, I'll try to be very brief. Well, I would like to, to, to separate between two different aspects. One is, would this device, this, would the technology be worth? Is, is the technology worth it? And the answer is, provided that in the open source electronic market, uh, there are a lot of different sensors. Some of them are, are of a very poor quality and others are of a very high quality. So, of course, being able to differentiate and pick the good sensors and provided that we are building agricultural grade casings, um, and and I would say professional level of software, all in all, all in all, the technology seems to be very good, at least more than enough for what we need in in a, in a greenhouse. We don't need uh, two decimal decimal points after the 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 the, the points. Uh, to decide if you need to open a window or not, an accuracy of one degree Celsius is more than enough. And actually, we have a 0.10 uh, degree of precision, so this is more than enough. Mm -hmm. And it is also durable. It lasts a long time. So we got that answer. Uh, that point has been checked. Now, in terms of adoption from the farmers, this is a totally different story. And it deals not just to these systems, it can be open source or not open source. It, it deals with uh, farmers approach, farmers level of education, also the level of precision they use to, to push their boundaries to towards optimization. So we would say that probably to be effective, this technology, especially for new takers, uh, it has to be accompanied by adequate training on optimized agricultural practices in general, not just because of the digital tool. The digital tool can be very useful uh, once those concepts are already in place. Mm, probably, if we had to compare between Vietnam and Uzbekistan, probably what is what we realize is that probably in Vietnam, in Vietnam, smallholder farmers were more keen about using this technology, but because they are 100% of their time commercial farmers and they were they are already familiar with concept of optimization and um, while in uzbekistan most of our beneficiaries are not only vegetable growers in the greenhouses they are also uh, livestock herders they are also doing different i mean they are proper livelihood i would say so uh this this being the greenhouse production not their first fourth of the day uh, they we felt like they were less keen about consulting the tool to to, to take um agricultural decisions however we also realized that there is also um, of course there are realities which are really, um, really, I mean, I would say really peculiar to the context. And in Uzbekistan, we realize that, for example, smallholders are very familiar with the use of the Telegram uh, messaging application. For, for those who don't, who don't know, Telegram is something very similar to messages. It's, it's just a software for, for exchanging messages. Now, what is possible is to, uh, what we realized that probably if we were having this uh, board talking to the internet, interacting with a Telegram bot, the farmer would receive on his mobile phone the information about his greenhouses in the form of short messages. But this could be Twitter, it could be any other software. And this is exactly what the youth at the DVI camp now is doing, is re, uh, formulate, re, um, let's say reformulate, repurpose the project to work through um, Telegram messages. So basically the farmer will receive alerts and information about the greenhouses directly in the form of messages. And it seems that this 
uh, it seems that this uh, this user interface would be more, more much more adapted to the to the spec instant smallholders. Exactly. So while technology itself it's important. Um, technology design is also essential. And all these other factors, uh, uh, digital literacy, general literacy, attitude of the farmers needs to be factored in, analyzed, uh, and go into the whole redesign process of the solution as we have done in Uzbekistan through uh, a redesign via Telegram, as you were saying. So, Leone, thanks a lot for the insights you shared with me. So now, I will turn to the audience for questions. Colleagues, feel welcome to raise your hand or post your question in the chat. And let me ask my co-host, Vanina, to help me pick a few questions that um, were, were posted in the chat. Thanks, Daniela, and thanks, Leone, for a very insightful talk. We actually have one question in the chat already. And it's about whether in the absence of training, what kind of support or assistance would farmers need? And do you envisage this as a service to farmers? And how would you charge them back? All right. So um, I thanks because this question, this uh, trying to answering this question will give me the opportunity to stress once again the importance that the digital tools are like are what they are. Um, they will help only at knowing more with more precision about the environmental conditions uh, inside the greenhouses. But the, the plants are not growing by themselves. They're not managed by the application. So the first of all, what, what is the purpose for us is to have nutritious food grown in um, in a decent manner, meaning decent jobs and uh, and um, of um a sufficient quality for the consumers. Now, um, this comes with a lot of work about horticultural operations, good agricultural practices, and so on. Uh, however, there are some tiresome operations. And I, once again, I would like to bring in pollination, that if we don't have availability for access to pollinators and insects, it's a matter of spending hours during the day uh, about stroking plants to, to increase uh, the, the, the setting of the flowers into fruits. Now, this operation is effective only if it's done between 21 and 25 degrees Celsius and the humidity, which is comprised between 60 and 80% of relative humidity. If we're doing this any time of the day when I have time, well, uh, I'm probably spending just a lot of time and work. So this is why, for example, you see, Thanks to the open source, we can design tools that are really fitting the purpose. There are two uh, small LED LEDs here, and one of them would turn on green when the conditions are ideal for pollination activities. So this is an example of how training and knowledge has, of course, to be shared up front. And the digital tool comes as a... Um, it's like the speedometer of the car, right? We need to know how to drive the car, but we need to know also how to respect limits. And the speedometer will, will tell us exactly when we are going uh, over the speed limit. And uh, in terms of, um, in terms of um, economics, as we said, open sources do, do work on a totally different business plan concept, okay? Uh, when we think about an, a, an economic activity, we think about, of course, a business plan and, and the way it should work. But open source works on another paradigm. Uh, the open source works on the basis that we can solve local pro local problem with, with local solution with solutions that are coming globally. So um, probably, probably, uh, I the only the probably I mean it's not me saying it; it's the researcher <laughs> talking about this. Uh, probably these type of solutions can stay cheap probably at one condition that local services are developed providing this type of technical uh, support and service i'm talking about some sort of after sale uh, or further development of the tool locally to local farmers only to uh, only if this assistance is provided by local uh, local people by local personnel and um, and i think this is the whole point and uh, of course as long as farmers are feeling that this service is useful 
they will probably they will be probably be happy to pay something back to those uh, to, to that youth okay or for whoever is providing this service and with i think that probably there will be some local ways of finding the right balance between demand and offer of uh, determining eventually the right price Thank you, Leone, for that. Um, and there's one more question that we will pose is, can you tell us how does the project deal with issues of network connectivity in rural areas? Thanks. This is perfect. Thank, thanks all for this question. This is a very good point. So oh, we realize that this is really, of, this is of course a very relevant matter. And we were, I think, lucky, but this is not just being fact of being lucky. So in both areas of the project, there was a cellular data coverage, okay, uh, 3G and 4G. Uh, but this brings us on to another uh, very important issue. I want to bring the example of Vietnam. In Vietnam, data connectivity is very cheap and very widely available, okay? And of course, this could be this, of course, is enabling the environment uh, for the digitalization. That this is a much broader concept. In the case of Uzbekistan, the connectivity is available. Probably it's less reliable and also, but the thing is that the cost is much steeper than the one we realized in Vietnam. Just to give you an example, in Vietnam, $10 would grant about six months of uh, data exchange, while in, in Uzbekistan, probably we need $20 or $30 per month. And of course, this is a huge limiting factor. Of course, there are other technologies. We don't necessarily need uh, data. Uh, there are other ways of communication, like low bandwidth uh, radio signals. There might be, uh, there are. Uh, there are other ways to, to develop these systems. And once again, what is interesting is that open source really provide us with all different solutions based on the problem. In this case, anyway, we decided to go ahead with data, with um, cellular data exchange and, and the Wi-Fi hotspot to have the devices connected. Thanks a lot, Leone. So yes, capacities, connectivity, financial viability, and overall sustainability. I'm seeing also more and more questions in the chat. Very interesting conversation. Really, it was great to have you today to learn about smart farming. Dear colleagues, thanks a lot for joining us today. Time is over, but actually I've seen lots of uh, interactions in the chat. So let me invite you to keep discussing this.